All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Not Matthew this morning, but Acts. Acts is also in the New Testament. It follows the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. This morning is Ascension Sunday. Some of you know what that means. Others of you think I just spoke in a foreign language, but Ascension Sunday is a huge day in the life of the church as it celebrates one of the major events in salvation history, namely the moment, the day that Jesus ascended from the earth back to heaven again. This day does not get the play that it should in the life of the church, certainly not like Christmas or Good Friday or Easter, not even as much as Pentecost Sunday does, which we'll be celebrating next Sunday. But this day was critical for God working out his plan of salvation for the world. And so today and next Sunday, we'll be taking a break through our journey through Matthew, and we'll be focusing on these two events. But these two events still fit under our heading of discipleship and mission. As we will see, they were critical for God unleashing his church into her mission of making disciples of all nations. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God for what scripture says, God says. If you're able, wherever you're at this morning, I want to invite you to rise with me as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is God's holy and inerrant word for you. Let's pray. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so would you shine your word brightly this morning that we may walk in your ways. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. The Christian faith does not simply reside in philosophical thought, though philosophical thought is certainly a part of the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not simply about moral behavior, though moral behavior is certainly a part of the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not simply about doctrinal statements of truth, though doctrinal statements of truth are certainly a part of the Christian faith. The Christian faith at its core is rooted in historical events. God doing things in history and then having them recorded and passed down to us, which then cause us to think philosophically, act morally, and develop doctrinal statements that reflect the truth of what God has done in his world. We call these events the history of salvation, those events recorded in the scriptures that show what God has done to come and redeem the world. 
Obviously, some of those events get more attention than others, as we've already said this morning. Christmas and the incarnation, when the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh and blood and was born of the Virgin Mary. Good Friday or the crucifixion, when we see the sinless God-man, Jesus Christ, get arrested, flogged, and crucified on a cross to pay the price of death for the sin of those who would trust in him. Easter or the resurrection, three days after Jesus' death, where he rose back to life again, conquering sin, death, and hell, and then offering new life, both now and for eternity, to those who would trust in him. But I have never heard of anyone giving or getting a gift or hosting a family celebration on Ascension Sunday. Oftentimes, when it comes to the important historical events, we stop at Easter. But we miss out then on these other two critically important events, the Ascension and next week, Pentecost. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts as the second part of a two-part volume, Luke Acts, reveals to us what happened to Jesus after his resurrection from the dead. Namely, that Jesus spent 40 days living with and appearing to his apostles and to hundreds of disciples to prove to them that he was alive and to teach them more and more about the kingdom of God. And on the 40th day after his resurrection, Luke testifies in two different places. At the end of his gospel in Luke 24, and here at the beginning of the book of Acts, Acts 1, why it is that Jesus is no longer physically on the earth, namely because he has ascended into heaven. And so 40 days after Easter, which was actually this past Thursday, is Ascension Day on the church calendar, but we celebrate it usually that following Sunday, which is today. And the Ascension is a significant day for us. Maybe you've memorized the Apostles' Creed. Maybe you've recited the Apostles' Creed within a worship service, and you have heard this event included in that creed, which all of the Christian faith affirms together regardless of our denomination. And so we hear that in the second part, which, which is in regards to Jesus, when it says this. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose from the dead and, here it is, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. As a percentage of space, the ascension gets quite a bit of coverage in the Apostles' Creed. And so let's dive into our text this morning and see this. That because Christ has ascended to his heavenly throne, we can trust him to equip us for the mission he has given to us. We're going to ask three questions this morning that help to shed light on the significance of this event. Namely, first, where did he go? Second, how did he go? And third, why did he go? Where, how, and why? And so first, Jesus is clearly no longer on the earth, so where did he go? Well, Luke goes to great lengths to make sure that we cannot possibly miss the final destination place of Jesus. And so four times in verses 10 to 11, he lets us see that Jesus was going into heaven. And this is even more clear in the ESV than the NIV, which I just read. Let me read verse 11 again for you from the ESV. It says this, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And Psalm 115.3 affirms that our God is in heaven. Heaven is the dwelling place of God. And so the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven 
is what we call his exaltation. It is his being exalted into the place of glory from where he had originally come. He's not just leaving the scene, so to speak. This is the culmination of all of his work. It is the crowning moment. And though Luke doesn't mention it here, the Old Testament writers had all foretold and the New Testament writers affirm that when Jesus went back to heaven again, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We see this phrase everywhere in the scriptures and we heard it in the Apostles' Creed. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Ephesians 1.20, Paul says that God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then Romans 8.34 says, Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So when Jesus went into heaven, he took his seat on his throne at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And that matters for us this morning because that seat is the place of honor and authority whereby Jesus now is the King of kings and the Lord of lords governs and rules his kingdom, his world, and will one day come to judge the living and the dead. In his ascension, we see that Jesus has accomplished the work that he was sent out to do. He ushered in his kingdom into this world so that sinful people like us can be restored into relationship with God again by repenting of our sin and trusting in the work of Jesus, of the King, so that that sin could be forgiven and so that his righteousness might be transferred to us and credited as ours, all of which makes us citizens of the kingdom of God, disciples of Jesus who now seek to advance his kingdom by proclaiming his gospel and who look forward to the eternal life that is to come when Jesus returns and ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus made all of this possible through his work, and he now sits down on his throne to indicate that his work has been accomplished. And because he was faithful to the mission his father had given to him, we read this said of him in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will eventually bow. Every tongue will eventually confess that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Lord. He is God in the flesh. He is the Christ, the only one worthy of our worship and worthy of our lives. And the king has ushered in his kingdom and he has sat down on his throne. We also come to understand by his going back into heaven and his sitting down at the right hand of the Father what he is doing there in that place. The book of Hebrews teaches us that Jesus Christ is our great high priest who is constantly and continually interceding for us on our behalf before the Father. We already read that in the Romans 8 passage that Jesus is always interceding for us, and we see that throughout the book of Hebrews. And then in chapter 7 of Hebrews, we read that the Old Testament priesthood that was established through Aaron was insufficient for attaining the forgiveness of sin, for attaining righteousness and justification because those priests who stood as mediators between God and men 
were themselves sinful and had to make sacrifice for their own sin. And it was impossible, as the book of Hebrews says, for the blood of animals to take away the sin of men. That whole system was a foreshadowing of what would become a reality in the gospel. And because those Old Testament priests were sinners, they too would die and one day, one day need to be replaced by those who would come after. But now, Jesus, as our great high priest, now holds his priesthood permanently. Because as the sinless God-man, he continues forever. And so we get this promise in Hebrews 7.25. He says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Friends, if you trust in Jesus, you never have to wonder whether your relationship with God is secure. If you are trusting in Jesus, you never have to wonder if you will be saved in the end. If you are trusting in Jesus, you never have to wonder whether your sin has been, is being, or will be forgiven in the future. For we have a great high priest who has sat down on his throne at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and who is constantly interceding on our behalf. He doesn't come like the Old Testament priests did with the blood of bulls and goats, which is impossible to take away human sin with. Rather, human, Hebrews 9.12 tells us this, that he comes by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. I heard someone say recently, and I didn't believe it when I first heard it, but I've come to believe it more and more, that one of the biggest struggles, maybe the biggest struggle for the majority of Christian people is the assurance of our salvation. We struggle to really believe that we are secure, daughters and sons of God, and whether or not we will let go in the end. Friends, let me just say this this morning. If it was up to us to hold on to the end, I am more than confident we would let go. But praise be to God, we have a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for us. The wrath of God for sin was poured out on him so that God the just was satisfied to look on him and to pardon us. And the enemy will try so hard to get you to focus on your own sin and your own struggles and your own failures and to make you doubt. But in those moments, look to the ascended Christ who has sat down on his throne at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who has declared it is finished, and who is now your intercessor, and who has secured for those who trust in him in eternal redemption. And so Luke helps us to see where it is that Jesus went, namely to heaven, to his throne, to the right hand of God the Father Almighty, to be our great high priest. And so second this morning, let's consider how he went there and why that would possibly matter for us. Now this is very subtle, but I think this matters a great deal for us who sit here 2,000 years later without having any eyewitnesses to that event still alive on the earth. Remember I said earlier that the Christian faith at its core is rooted in historical events. And if we are going to base our life and stake our eternity 
on the significance of those events, having eyewitnesses to them is critical and certainly helpful. And Jesus knew this, which is why after he rose back to life from the dead, he didn't just return to heaven in that moment. He could have, right? Three times in the book of Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles. He's going to be killed. And three days later, he will rise back to life again. And so Jesus could have had the expectation They were listening, they were paying attention, they were believing what I said, and now that I have risen, I go back to heaven, and they'll know what that means, and they'll just start living out their mission of proclaiming the gospel and advancing the kingdom. And yet our text today reiterates that though Jesus had told them exactly what was going to happen, he remained with them for 40 days on the earth. Why? Why? Well, Luke told us in verse 3 that it was to prove to them that he was alive. To prove to them and to prove to us 2,000 years later that the body wasn't just stolen. The women didn't just go to the wrong tomb. But to give us confidence in the historical events for having 500 plus people witness his resurrected body gives us confidence in the records that we have. And the same is true with the ascension. He could have just disappeared after he had proven to them that he was alive, after he had taught them everything he desired to about the kingdom. He could have just disappeared and they would have had the Old Testament prophets that told them that when he left, he was going to the Father's right hand. And yet we read this in verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus made sure he ascended as they were looking on, so that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt and would testify for generations to come through the written Word of God. Why it is that Jesus is no longer with us on the earth. And I hope you can see this morning that it is God's desire for his apostles, his disciples, his church, for you to have confidence in your faith. Our faith does not rest on the testimony of one person. That would be a weak case in any courtroom. The Bible was not written down by one person, nor the the prophecies received by one person. That would be a weak case. Rather, the Bible has dozens of authors over thousands of years who all testified to the same truth. And here we have 11 men who all testified together that they know exactly why Jesus is no longer on the earth, and it is because he has ascended to heaven again. John Calvin says this. He says, And it was needful that the history should have been set down so diligently for our cause, that we may know assuredly that although the Son of God appears nowhere upon the earth, Yet does he live in the heavens. Be confident, my friends. God has not left you without a testimony, without a witness. Jesus is alive. He has ascended into heaven. He has sat down on his throne at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He is governing his kingdom and he is interceding for you. Finally, this morning, let's close by asking the question, why did he go? Why did he leave? And this is a critical question that will actually feed into what we hear and see next week with Pentecost Sunday. But like every other question that we ask, the answer was actually given long before we see the events play themselves out. And so in the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus proclaim to the crowds these words. 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What does he mean by that? Rivers of living water. Well, John follows up that statement by Jesus with this commentary. He says, now this he said about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given. Because, why? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, throughout the scriptures, beginning in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, Psalm 46, Ezekiel 47, Revelation 22, and many others, and those are all in the sermon notes today if you want to look them up later. We see this image of a river of living water serving as a representation of the Holy Spirit dwelling in and providing life to those who are in relationship with God. And so John is making this connection, this point here in chapter 7. But he states that at this time, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out, had not been sent into the lives of Jesus' disciples. And why not? Well, it is because Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, his glorification, his ascension into heaven to his throne at the right hand of God the Father Almighty was the trigger for the Holy Spirit being unleashed into the world and into the lives and hearts of Jesus' disciples. And so the ascension then is really the pivot point in the history of salvation, whereby Jesus leaves the scene having accomplished his work to make room for another to be sent out, namely the Holy Spirit. Now, during the Last Supper in John's Gospel, Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he's explaining to them that the time is coming where he's going to have to return to the one who sent him, namely to the Father, And that the disciples will be sad when this happens. But then Jesus says this to them. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness, and judgment. See, in Jesus giving his apostles and his church, us, the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, he has given us a monumental task. But it is not a task he has not equipped us for. For in Jesus leaving this earth physically, he now dwells with his people even more intimately, even more fully through the Holy Spirit, thereby fulfilling the promise he gave us at the end of the Great Commission when he said, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And here is Jesus' promise in John 16 that the Holy Spirit will equip us for the mission of proclaiming the gospel and making disciples. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The mission of disciples, to make more disciples and to mature as disciples, is hard. But we need to know this this morning. That in Jesus ascending, he has equipped us with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit to do the work he has called us to do. He has equipped us for the mission he has given to us. And so as we close, in Jesus ascending 
to his heavenly throne and sitting down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, we can trust that he has, in fact, equipped us for the kingdom mission of making disciples and maturing as disciples because he has sent the Holy Spirit into our lives. And we can be assured that just as Jesus has ascended into heaven, so too, for those who have trusted in him, we will one day follow him there. For there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so today, if you have not yet repented of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, would you today turn to him and find that living water that he offers so that you will never be thirsty again? Would you repent of your sin and put your faith in the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord? And find in him true life, both now and for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, how marvelous are your plans. I look over all the events you have used to save your people, and I stand in awe of you. And I worship you. Father, our hearts are weak, and we so often believe the lie of the enemy. And so may we look to the ascended Christ and to see in him our great high priest whose name is love, who will never let us go. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.